Hi everyone, this is Yuntin. The subject of tonight's talk is going to be reflecting on your inner world. And there's a lot of reasons for doing this kind of reflection, but part of it, I think, is that we're not always sure how much control we have over our own happiness, how much control we have over the external world, how much we can navigate our moods and, you know, kind of be authentically real with whatever is coming up while at the same time being engaged with others in a way that's compassionate. How do we, you know, quote, honor our own needs while at the same time being aware of those of others and really making sure we accommodate them as well? What is it to be enabling? What is it to be proactive? What is it to be aware of? I don't know, the suffering of all sentient beings while not neglecting yourself, but also not becoming so obsessed with your own kind of momentary passing moods that you forget to notice what's going on for other people. So in Buddhism, we talk a lot about how the mind can kind of be mentally divided into two main categories. We talk about the main mind and the mental factors. The main minds are related to your sensory experiences as well as a more subtle level of mental experience. And they are a little bit more objective, even though it's subjective. Your main minds are really interesting because they hold the generality of things. You know, it sees a blue sky, it hears the sound of geese, it has thoughts arise and dissolve, but doesn't have a lot of opinions and judgments about them. Now, you have mental factors arising at the exact same time as your main minds. And those mental factors are what are telling you what is important or significant, what to move your attention towards or away from. Your mental factors are the busy part. And sometimes they're very useful and very functional, and sometimes they're not. So what we want to do is just kind of look into how can we reveal and expose our baseline peace of mind without trying to, I don't know, chase and grasp onto the idea of finding peace of mind. Because you're going to have all sorts of thoughts and ideas. And your thoughts and ideas can be something that you really try and dig into and manipulate in real time and force them to go one way or the other. But sometimes a more skillful approach is just let them be. Let them do what they want. Let your thoughts be busy or quiet. Let them be agitated or peaceful. Just let your thoughts be. And gently shift your focus to the main minds. And kind of rest your focus there. And you can do that, of course, in meditation. But it's not just meditation. It can be in daily life where you become the observer of your experience not in a dissociative way, not in a distracted way, but just kind of an open, expansive awareness. An analogy I like is, imagine yourself, maybe as a very old person, sitting on a porch in a rocking chair. And as you sit on the porch in the rocking chair, you're watching the world go by, and you're not one of those nosy neighbors, you're not one of those judgmental old folks, you're just watching. You know, truck goes by, you say, huh, truck going by. Yeah, fox runs it across the road, you think, oh, fox running across the road. And you're just kind of being with each moment as it arises. And in that kind of observer stance, there can be a lot of deep contentment. And I think that we all kind of know that place of deep contentment that's just expansively watching without deciding that things mean anything in particular without chasing certain thoughts or pushing away other ones. So meditation is when we structure ourselves in building the habit of bare observation and connecting deeply with the stability and clarity that's natural within the mind. But don't think that's the only time you get to do that. You know, you can be doing it in your daily life as well, and it can really reinforce one another. So that's just kind of the background. And then we dig into the specifics, okay? So specifically, what destroys our peace of mind? And as you think about those things that kind of steal your peace of mind, 
they can usually be broken into two categories. You're hoping for something or you're fearing something. You're wanting more or you're wanting less. Something about life is either too much or not enough. Yeah, it just does that ring true for you? You know, there's a million details and a million specifics of that. But in general, does stress boil down to a feeling of this is all too much or this is all not enough? Or I need this to stay and grow or I need this to leave and dissipate. You know, there's either a push or a pull in the mind. And if we can really come to understand the the root of the push and the pull, that can be incredibly transformative. But even if we can just see the surface absence of logic in the push and the pull, we'll have a lot more everyday peace of mind. So these are in Buddhism divided into pairs, and the, the pairs are called the eight worldly concerns. So it's a good time to really ask ourselves, how much of the day do I spend chasing? How much of the day do I spend pushing? And so specifically you look at basic physical situation, right? Your basic physical situation of chasing comfort, um, you know, wanting more pleasurable experiences, wanting more ease, and the times that you really feel like you need to avoid pain or move yourself away from discomfort. So the first one to look at is pleasure and pain. And it's not wrong or bad to want pleasure or to avoid pain. That's not at all what the teaching is. The teaching is to find out what does that do to the mind and how much do we increase our stress level by this kind of adjustment, adjustment, you know, shifting and reshifting and fidgeting externally and fidgeting internally, just trying to get comfortable. So you sit with, hmm, I'm trying to get comfortable right now. Was I comfortable five minutes ago? And then I thought of something that kind of disturbed my mind. And because that's uncomfortable to turn towards, now I'm just fidgeting. Getting a new cushion, getting a new seat, getting a snack, I don't know, scrolling through my phone. And you think, oh, it's because I'm uncomfortable, I don't like this chair. But the chair was fine five minutes ago, you just didn't like the thoughts you were having. Yeah. So noticing that can be incredibly useful because then you break the spell of thinking the happiness is achieved through a physical adjustment. I mean, of course, if you're uncomfortable and your foot's falling asleep, grab a cushion. It's not going against common sense, but it's about not giving these surface things more power than they actually have. So pleasure and pain is the first kind of pair of hope and fear that dominates our day. And if we can catch ourselves chasing or pushing internally, sometimes just catching it is enough to unhook. Just noticing that the mind is doing this running after wanting more or pushing away because it feels overwhelmed. Just noticing that you can relax. So it's, it's an interesting thing to sit with and then you shift to thinking how much of the day is wanting to acquire and wanting to not lose. So the next pair is gain and loss. Gain and loss can refer to specific material stuff you like, but it can also refer to situations you're attached to and people you're attached to, and that's of course far more confronting. So you can kind of start to unpack this one by remembering times that you were sure you would be happy if you acquired something specific, and then once you acquired it, the happiness isn't what you thought it would be. Sometimes getting what you want isn't the best thing, but you be, we become so certain that our quality of life is going to improve once we acquire something that we make that true in our mind. We make it true. It wasn't true, but we made it true. And sometimes it works for a moment and our level of happiness is increased for a moment, but we have to ask ourselves what's on the next second or the next day or the next month of that. 
And this ties very much into the, um, the first noble truth, the truth of suffering, the suffering of change in particular. The idea is that the first moment of happiness in samsara is also the first moment of the suffering of it. You know, so you want to go to the beach, it's exciting, you go to the beach, you go for a swim, it's lovely, you get cold, you get out of the water, you relax and bask in the sunshine, then you get too hot and you need to go back in the sea, then you get too cold and tired and you go back out, and it feels like a day of enjoyment. And it is, but it's not what we anticipate it to be from our attachment mind. And often after a very pleasurable event that had a lot of planning, we have kind of a disappointed feeling. There can be kind of a letdown, like, that wasn't as good as I thought it would be. That didn't last as long as I thought it would. I thought there would be more than this. And you're remembering other times you did the same thing. And in those other times, your memory gets slightly edited. You know, you extract the parts from your memory that were not what your narrative wanted it to be. You made it better, or you made it worse, or you added a soundtrack, or whatever, or you merged several events together. And, you know, that means that the present moment can never live up to an edited past, or anticipating something that can never be exactly that way, because we're not in charge of all of the conditions. So if you can catch yourself assuming that your quality of life is going to be better once you get whatever it is, again, you can break the spell. Before you believe what you're saying to yourself, just have a moment's pause and ask, has that historically been true? Is that actually true now? And is giving that the power to be truth going to actually disempower me in some way? You just kind of sit with that. And then we have all sorts of assumptions about loss too, don't we? That if I lose this, I won't be happy. Or if I lose this, I'll suffer. Or if I lose this situation. Or if I lose this person. That without them, there can't be happiness. Which of course isn't true, but we make it true when we believe it. So then the pull is, you know, also, I can't lose this. What can I do to manage this? How can I protect this? And there becomes a lot of mental energy trying to manipulate conditions you don't have control over. And then you're exhausted. Yeah. So it's this delicate line of being very engaged and very invested in life and very present while letting go. You know, you're all in. You're as focused as you can be without assuming that you're in charge or you're the boss of everything, without telling yourself you could get everything under control, breaking the illusion that perfect stability is possible. So it's this do your best and let go, and do your best and let go, and be completely engaged and then let go. This kind of razor's edge where you have goals and plans and aspirations, but you're not tightly holding on to them, assuming those are the only things to make you happy. Yeah. So the gain and loss one is really interesting, and the way you can unpack the loss side is to remember times when you have been freed up when you've lost something you thought you needed. You know, maybe you lost a job, and you did need the job for the money, or for the status, or for the stability, or for the social interaction. You did. You needed it. But there was also a great freedom and a great creativity in, now what shall I do? You know, the world opened back up again. Some possibilities opened back up again. Okay. So this is all really common sense. This isn't something that is new to you. The point is that you have to remember your wisdom on purpose. You have to bring it to the forefront of your mind and remember that our own thoughts can sometimes lie to us. Yeah, and to try and consciously have a bit of space to check, is what I'm saying to myself useful and true? Is what I'm saying to myself kind and sustainable? 
you know, gain and loss is uh, pretty obvious to see in our daily life, you know, pleasure and pain is pretty obvious to see in our daily life. Slightly more confronting is our interactions with people specifically. And then we get to this next pair, which is not wanting criticism and really craving praise. And having the push and pull of, I cannot be criticized, I don't want to be criticized, I don't want people to say unkind things to me or about people and things that I care about. I don't want to hear negative words, I don't want to hear harsh speech, I just don't want it. And there's kind of a pushing away energy of, I don't want to hear this. You know, and there's a ton of topics that could be related to, but we do have some little trigger in us that is, I don't want to hear this. And then we also have something in us that I want to hear more of that. And it's usually validation. And often we have so much pride that we don't admit how much validation we seek. How much underneath a lot of our words is the question, am I good? Do you like me? You know, because it's so basic, you can be too embarrassed to admit it. You know, when I'm talking to someone, I'm not asking if they like me. I'm not asking if they agree with me. I'm not asking if I'm good. Of course not. I'm an adult. And yet, is there something under that really is seeking that approval? You know? You're saying, uh, you know, hey, coworkers, I finished that report a day early, and look, I added this cool index or whatever. And what you're thinking you're wanting is them to say, oh, great, that's useful, we'll do that. But even more subtle is some sort of pat on the back that says, aren't you smart and efficient and good? Aren't you clever and we love you so much? You know, and it's embarrassing to admit that to ourselves but we are often craving approval in the words that we use, in the words that we're listening for. And then of course, as we all know, when people criticize us, even if we've had a hundred validations that day, we hear and remember and capture the criticism and really beat ourselves up with it, either with a pride that says, how dare they misunderstand me? How dare they disrespect me? Or a mind that says, oh, it must be true, I'm terrible. Oh, it must be true, I'm terrible. But either way, you know, we really take it to heart. Yeah. And so when you're looking at how much power you give to the speech of others, this is a place of great learning and also a place that can have a lot of embarrassment. And I think if there isn't a little cringe of, oh, gosh, I do that then maybe there's not enough self-awareness coming to this examination. You know, so just sit with that for a second of today, just today, when we were talking to people and listening to people, whether by text or online or whatever, was there an underlying, I hope I don't get criticized, I hope I do get validated? Was that under and under and under the content? Was that driving a lot of the communication? And when it was, <laughs> was your level of happiness um, within your control? Was it sustainable? You know, it could be that someone did praise you and told you you were good and you did a good job and you're being very helpful and they love you and think you're amazing and yada, yada, yada. And sometimes that does make us feel happy for a second. And then we might cringe and think, oh no, what if they find out how normal I am? Oh no. Or, yes, I am. Give me more, please. You know, often that very thing that we think we need has a not enough feeling to it. And doing this reflection about just today, you know, let alone the past, can help you tomorrow unhook from that little game in your head that's just, you know, hunting for validation. Or hiding from criticism. And you already know the nature of praise and criticism is very much related to the person telling you, not very much related to you. And yet, there is still this habit of believing it's something about you. What if we took nothing personally, even when it was personal? When someone criticizes us, sometimes it's an accurate observation that is very useful for us to take on board in order to grow. 
And a lot of the time, it's someone else's stuff, right? They've chosen to fixate on one thing or one behavior, and they fixated on it because they don't like their own life, or they don't like you, or they're jealous, or whatever. Or it's just an opinion, you know? It's something that doesn't have nearly as much power as they're giving it either. And we already know that, that when people criticize us, it has a lot more to do with them than it has to do with us. But we forget in the moment of the criticism and we take it like a wound. And then we either crumple or we attack, wasting more energy, wasting more time, making ourselves more exhausted. So really examining your inner world and the inner conversations and assumptions you have, this gives you the power back to control your moods. Then the last pair of this hope and fear, push and pull thing we have going on in our mind all the time is about reputation. We crave a good reputation or even fame or some sort of renown. We want people to speak and think well of us even when we're not there. And then we fear bad reputation or defamation or being, you know, sort of spoken ill of. And the underlying assumption is, if people like me, my life is happy. If people don't like me, my life is bad. And we actually do oversimplify things in that way, forgetting that when everybody likes you and thinks you're amazing, your time is in so much demand, isn't it? Your time is in so much demand. People are always after you to do stuff. They're after you for approval. They're after you for this and this and this and this. So it's not a horrible thing to have a good reputation, but break the spell that thinks it's an inherent source of joy. Because it's not. It can actually be a source of a lot of work, a lot of extra stuff going on. And then you shift to, is having a bad reputation necessarily bad? And it's very hard for us to break the spell of this one. We think, of course, having a bad reputation is bad. But what are some advantages? There could be more time in your life. There could be a lot more space to pursue the things you're interested in. If you've ever, I don't know, been involved with a scandal or been involved with a big mistake or been, you know, really looked down on by a group of people, isn't that the very time you find out who your real friends are and who authentically, genuinely loves you, as opposed to those who are just pretending because it suited their reputation? So having a bad reputation is not necessarily a bad thing or a source of suffering. Again, we already know this, but we have to remember on purpose in order to break the spell of our negative patterns in our daily life. Yeah. So those are the eight worldly concerns. And that's what's going on in our inner world with our mental factors that condition and color the main mind. So the mental factors, you know, they're described like the clouds in the sky or the fish in the sea, or if you have clear water, that's the main mind and you drop food coloring in it, that's the mental factors. It's the mental factors that we need to try to impose some control on so that they color the main mind in a way that's useful, peaceful, effective. That's one approach. The other approach is to focus on the main mind and in a way ignore the mental factors or choose not to give them your interest or focus. So just kind of go into that space-like clarity of the mind. The sky, not the clouds the water, not the fish. Um, you know, lots of analogies can be given to help us understand that there are two, many more than two, but two things happening in your mind at every moment. There's something that is expansive and spacious and clear and reflective. And there's something that's moving and talking and judging and, you know, neither of them are good or bad in and of themselves but the mental factors do color the main mind and the content of the mental factors is usually the eight worldly concerns that we've just talked about. So just thinking of those pairs, what are your favorites? <laughs> favorites for lack of a better word. When your peace is destroyed during a day, is it more likely to be because 
you're focused on comfort, pleasure, and avoiding discomfort, pain? Is that kind of the main disruptor of peace in your life? Is it kind of a, a more physical, sensorial kind of push and pull? I need more snacks, I need less cold, I need more cushions, I need a less hard chair. Is it that kind of a push and pull that's, you know, kind of making strategies to get some kind of physical pleasure? Or is it, you know, you're reading the news, you genuinely read the news, it's a good thing, but then you go into a social media vortex or uh, you fall into the scrolling spell and it's like you're scrolling for happiness Where's... is your pair more about gain and loss about wanting to get stuff and not lose stuff assuming that happiness is acquisition and that sadness is loss are you more focused on words that people say in the course of the day, is your push and pull more about communication? Or is the push and pull in your day more about reputation and how you assume or want people to think of you? And it's not like there's, you know, better or worse. It's just a really important self-knowing of my go-to agitation is this. So let's try and catch it in real time to kind of break it apart and diffuse it and kind of get rid of the energy of it to come back to the mind's natural ability for peace. So we can cultivate things that create peace or we can disengage with what steals our peace. Understanding the eight worldly concerns is very useful. Um, you can catch them and then feel released. It could be that you're more someone who likes to be proactive and kind of fill up the mind with something that is positive and productive and skillful rather than disengage from what's negative, harmful, unskillful. Both approaches are completely fine. So the approach of building and cultivating positive states of mind, it's like you fill the mind up with so much positive there's no room for the negative to get in. But the danger with that approach is spiritual bypassing. And spiritual bypassing is when you know how you're supposed to think about something, and so you think that's how you already do think about something. So you have a difficult coworker or a difficult family member and they're saying something rude. You jump over the fact that it hurt you or you jump over the fact that it annoyed you and you think, oh, I have so much patience and love for them. And when people are like that, my heart just opens. And you're lying to yourself, um, and you're lying to them, and you're being ingenuine and plastic. But there's something sweet in the center of it, which is you want to have patience for them. You want to have compassion for them. And that's where you want your mind to be going. But if you pretend that's how you already feel, it's not going to work. So to fill the mind up with positive states of mind so that negative states of mind and unhappiness and suffering can't get in, you need to do a bit of a preemptive strike at the beginning of your day. So at the beginning of your day, setting a motivation that is very clear and very specific about what you want to do with your life and what the purpose of your life is. It can be something traditionally Buddhist, or it can be something specific to you, a poem or a prayer that you love. But, you know, even small children can start doing this, where they can think, my life is about giving and receiving peace, or giving and receiving compassion, or building love in communities, or defusing conflict where I see it, or whatever, you know, something positive and altruistic that doesn't neglect you as an individual, but doesn't become hyper-focused and self-conscious about you as an individual either. And if you start your day very genuinely filled up with what you think is important, even if it's just compassion, just one word, it's not a whole prayer, if you just sit with, the purpose of my life is compassion, to find it, to grow it, to give energy to it, to send it, etc., etc., that is the point, then 
then you become filled up in such a way that at least for the morning, negative states of mind don't have time to come in.